And we are live, thankfully. Um, so people in the comments, you have to tell me if you liked it better when there was no video or sound and you just could comment or if it's actually better when we're here. Um, anyway, I want to invite or in, want to welcome today, try that one, uh, Michael Roberti. Uh, he is the author of two book, a book, a novella, and a second book is coming out, um, The Traders We Are, which is one of the coolest names of a book I've heard in a while. And a novella is The Revenge of Thousands. And just to outdo yourself, the book coming out in May is A Grave for All of Us. A Grave for Us All. Oh, actually, I just got the proof today. A Grave for Us All. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, you're good, dude. You're good. I, uh, uh, those are killer titles. Thank you. I um, the I know we were talking before the stream about like how how I come up with them and stuff, and I like, I I really don't like they kind of come to me weirdly enough. I remember uh, the traders we are. I was like watching my kids play on a playground, and uh, I changed the name of the like the working title because I was like it was it was uh, salt in the wound. Weirdly enough, which is also another Spiffbo book, <laughs> and um, I was just like all of a sudden in my head it was just like the traders we are a grave for us all, and then the third one will be. I was like, well, I feel like there's a progression, and the next one will be uh, until worms remain. Nice. So, um, what is your your book? Is grimdark? Is that correct? Um, yeah. So it's it's kind of on the edge of grimdark. I would say uh, grave is significantly more grimdark than uh, traitors is, um, but it's it's kind of um, it, it, it skirts that line. Okay. And what drew you to grimdark? Is this because you're a high school English teacher? Is that what drew you to Grimdark? Well, we, me and uh, Kevin, hi Kevin and Bo, um, and Tim, um, but we joke that like my life is so Grimdark with some of the things I describe in our uh, Silverstones chat um, that it, it might be a natural outpouring. But I think like I really liked Joe Abercrombie's work and George R. R. Martin's and the idea of that. And I think this is why I'm not quite Grimdark um, because I, I, I steer a little bit away from the you know, bad pe people in a bad situation. It's more, these are people and this is their situation and they're trying to find hope in it. And that doesn't always work out for them. Right. Uh, but, you know, especially the third book, the theme is going to be, can we do better? You know what I mean? Like this all has happened to us and we have to be accountable for the things that we've done and the things that we've left undone. But now how going forward will this uh, affect us? Okay. And a question I want to make sure I get in here before we get too deep is um, you are a high school English teacher, yes? Mm -hmm. Why on earth are you not writing young adult when you have like a hundred or more examples every year that you could you know, base your characters on? I thought about that, to be honest. Um, it So weirdly enough, my sister uh, writes young adult and she uh, is aged to the shopping her books. Um, I just never really liked it. You know, I, um, I mostly read lit fiction and fantasy and I've tried lit fiction before, but the hard thing about that is a lot of times the books aren't really about anything. It's more the vibe or more the theme. Um, and, you know, so I just, I always really liked like Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit and other fantasy stuff. Um, I play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, so I think that might be a big part of it. Um, and, you know, just like, uh, actually like the Traders world is uh, the one that I play Dungeons and Dragons in with uh, with several friends. So some of these stories are actually familiar to them. So, and Bo has a comment here. Yeah. Beardless. Yeah. I um, I was actually speaking of, and I don't know if anybody from my school is watching this, but I was actually, um, I had interviews for uh, curriculum design jobs. Um, so far, no luck, but um, I, I thought it would look a little bit more uh, professional if I uh, lost the beard. <laughs> Oh, yep. Nice. So we, will, I want to ask you about Silverstone books yeah. and how did you find them and how you get because I, I've seen you're tied to them a couple of different ways and. Well, actually, Kevin approached me back when uh, Traders got its uh, the the cover that it has now because the one before that looked like poop, and <laughs> um, so you know Kevin was like, "Hey, uh, Mike, it's not showing up on Ingram. How can I get your book?" And we just started talking that way and that relationship kind of evolved just over the course of like a year or two where, you know, we kept talking and kept in contact. And then, you know, Quinn uh, started blogging with, uh, with Silverstones 
And then um, I think Kevin asked if uh, he if he could repost my uh, the book that wouldn't burn review when I when I read that because that was that book like blew my mind. And then we talked about having me on there. And I'm actually supposed to post every Tuesday, but I just never have any time. Um, so I do I do it when I can, but with like the two kids. And I'm actually not only am I an English teacher, but I'm a driver's ed teacher too. So oh. that's like after school. <laughs> okay, now I know how you, why you do grim dark. Okay. Yeah. Oh my goodness. You you. You don't appreciate your own mortality until you're teaching a 14 or 15 year old how to drive. Oof. Yeah, I, I can't imagine. Um, let's see. Uh, so I I used the. Oh, oh, here we go. More comments. Yeah, there we go. But where did you come up with the idea that when a person dies, everything they've written disappears? Where did that come from? Because that's. Pretty novel. Oh, th thank you. So I I remember okay. vaguely coming up with it over a summer one time, um, and you know, so and I, like the idea actually originally wasn't going to be tied to this world, and I just remember thinking like, you know, if if we lost all knowledge, what would people think is magic? And that that's going to be that comes up in grave a little bit more than it did in traders, um, and you know, how do we know that the history that we know is the correct history? Because, I mean, like, you know, even in our world, the Library of Alexandria, the sacking of the Irish monasteries and uh, things of that mm -hmm. nature. And I, I bring up this one thing. And Andrew Meredith always tells me what the, the name of the thing is. But one time they found a machine on a Greek boat. That the sunk. device. That's exactly it. And I was thinking about that and about how, like, they're like, well, they don't have that technology. But they did. But it was yeah. lost. And, you know, like every time somebody dies in this world, it's like their own little Library of Alexandria burning, you know. Um, nice. yeah. And, I, and then, so like, I was thinking about the implications and as I was writing traders, I came up with the idea that, you know, either, uh, you have scraps of paper of your loved ones that signature, like sign the, sign the scraps of paper. And then in like the wealthier areas, they have like signature books that they keep in the family home. Um, and then the grave is going to get it more into the, uh, the motivations that the disappearing writing can cause. Cause a lot of people wanted a little bit more of that in traders. And what's funny is, with traders, like traders is not my main story in this world that I want to do. And the, the big epic sweeping one is going to be more about the writing disappearing, why that is um, more worldwide. But I wanted to get my um, I wanted to get my writing a little bit better before I did that. So I, I picked a story I was really familiar with, which is the story of the crown and the tide, uh, because even though it's not one that I uh, had in my Dungeon Dragons group, like nobody's played through that story. It got referenced a lot as something that certainly had happened. This is what happened. It's affected the world in this way. And it's kind of like, a, I thought it was a good starting place. So Crown and Tide, that's going to be a trilogy or? Yeah, it, it, it's definitely, there's not going to be a fourth book in that one. And any more novellas tied to that or? I was thinking I might. Uh, there's there's a character or a couple of ca characters that I really like that didn't get a lot of screen time because um, they died either in Traders or like at the very beginning of Traders. And uh, one of them, I kind of want to give his own, because I just think he's an interesting dude. Um, but one of the Oberlin siblings, and honestly, it's not its not a spoiler, because hes you don't even get to see him before he's dead, like mentioned as being dead. Uh, <laughs> but the older sibling of two of the main cast, uh, Kale and Merrily's older brother is dead. And he takes, uh, he's a point of view in The Revenge of Thousands. And he's a very conflicted character on a multitude of different ways. And you get to see a little bit of that in Grave because um, I do a lot of flashback characters or flashback chapters with characters that are dead. Um, and then I also want to do, without spoiling it too much, I had an idea for like a spaghetti western samurai thing with two of the characters where it was just going to be called The Revenge of Two. And it was going to be like kind of a spinoff of this whole everything that's happened. Okay, so my next question was going to be, and you kind of answered, you write third person mm -hmm. or first? Okay, yeah, and sure. several POVs in your yeah. books, yes? Oh, yeah. Do you head hop in chapters, or does everybody get their own chapter before you change mm -hmm. heads? Um, I'll, I usually list them if the chapter has more than one point of view. Um, they'll be listed, and usually there'll be line breaks. So, like, uh, chapter four of Traders is the first time I do that. And it's two sides of a battle. You have uh, Kale, who's like one of the main characters, and then Emil, who's the other character on the other side. Um, and then on Grave, uh, two characters are routinely, almost all of their chapters are 
combined because their story is so intertwined and it's it's about right. their relationship more than anything. Okay. Um, so when you, your stories, which are skirting this edge of grim dark, does that mean you don't do a lot of violence or a lot of gore or? <laughs> no, or I do you... a lot of violence. The, I, oh, Hey, Catherine. Um, I, there's a lot of violence, uh, especially in grave, but there's no explicit sex. Um, I didn't, I, I limited the swearing to a couple of, um, like minor profanity. Um, the first draft of traders had like 50 F words in it. And I'm not, that was the thing I had to kind of like, cause like, I'm a religious dude. I, um, I have two kids, you know, I, and I was like, I don't know if that's what I want to put out in the world. I was just kind of like stream of consciousness missing it. And, um, so, uh, there's some fade to black sex scenes. Um, there is some, uh, you know, there's a profanity. Um, I would say that there are characters and chapters that are grimdark. So one that, uh, you know, my friend Quinn really was excited about in grave and he hasn't read it yet is a character named, uh, Zopa of goal. And he is extremely grimdark. Um, Mathis Quinlan, who's in both books, is extremely, especially in this one, very grimdark. And then, you know, everybody else is, it's almost like they make um, bad or, you know, treacherous decisions, but I don't know that they're necessarily on their own grimdark. And I don't know that the vibe overall is grimdark, except for a few specific moments. Okay. And I have to ask the age old question. Mm -hmm. Can you define grimdark? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about that a lot recently because I read Blood Meridian or I listened to it. And it's not a fantasy book. It's a, a Western or I guess some people say it's an anti-Western by Cormac McCarthy. And it, it, I guess he called it a grimdark Western. <laughs> but it's an aesthetic thing, I think, more than anything. And I, it's like um, the oppressiveness of, you know, just like nothing is good everything is bad and the characters don't have the ability to really change that or have the ability to see hope in that. And I think, so somebody was telling me, I think it was Andrew Meredith. Once again, we talk a lot that um, what I'm technically would be considered noble dark because my book is definitely dark fantasy, but the characters have agent, the agency to try to affect the world and sometimes in positive ways. Um, but very, very much so like the, uh, the grim dark, I think is like, um, I don't even call like a lot of people will say like, you know, uh, Joe Abercrombie is the poster child for grim dark. I'd say, um, the indie wise, uh, John Palandino to me, that's, you know, that's grim dark because all of the characters are very irredeemable. There's, <laughs> there's not that, there's not that chance that there's that feeling of it's not going to get better. You know what I mean? And I think right. that's a big part of it. So, um, taking a hard right turn here, okay. which I'm sure you've seen from your students. Oh yeah. What is the what is the strangest job you've ever had? Oh man. Okay. Um, so I got three that are equally strange. I was one of the tele when I was like 17. I was a telemarketer that asked political questions, and I'd call people up and be like, "Do you somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, or whatever?" Um, I worked at a factory where they make coins. And they made the coins that they flip in the Super Bowl and also like commemorative coins. Like when uh, Pope John Paul II died, they made those coins. And then I was the uh, the singer of a hardcore punk band. Hardcore punk. OK, nice. So what was the name of your band? Uh, Maury after the TV show, like the um, what's it, the talk show? Oh, OK. Maury Povich. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind yeah. of. I we used to watch it during band breaks and we thought that it was kind of a punk rock show. So we were like, yeah, let's call ourselves Maury. Okay. Um, so in your books, is there magic or is it the magic confined to, you know, people's writings disappearing? Um, there, there is magic. Um, book one, uh, there is a little bit of magic. Um, there's a little bit referenced. There's one specific scene where um, there is like some like mages that are casting a fire spell uh, but magic is kind of a high cost, very more rare thing in the world. And then you have uh, grave. There's a significant amount more magic um, because uh, like the character that I said was Grimdark Zopa of Goal is maybe one of the most powerful people in like the entire setting at that time. Um, and then there's like, you know, there's a little bit of like sort like a uh, prophecy and uh, dark goddesses. But uh, for the most part, it's, it's very magic light. Okay. And I meant to ask this earlier, but who are your main characters and what do they want at the start of the book? 
Okay. So um, the three, the big three are uh, Kale Oberlin, uh, Marilee Oberlin, his little sister, and Emil Trestenson. Uh, Kale is at the very beginning of, tra beginning of Traders is uh, watching his best friend die, who's engaged to his sister, and you know watches his signature disappear. Uh, his dad is the um, leader of their country, um, and they or their I guess faction province of the country, and he kind of has a really antagonistic relationship with his dad. Uh, but what he kind of wants is the war to be over, and also for everybody on the other side to die, which is kind of you know not necessarily uh, you know a good mix. And then uh, his little sister, her fiance died. Um, and she really wants things to go back the way things were. And without too many spoilers, she gets involved in the overall narrative um, as like kind of a political pawn, at least in the first book, and comes more to her, to her own in the second one. And then uh, Emil, he is the nephew of the king on the other side, and he thinks he is destined to be a war hero. Uh, he's supposed to be the governor of the province that's rebelling, and he um, he just thinks that everybody's not treating him fairly. And if they all just kind of thought about it and sat down and were like, hey, this guy's really good. And uh, weirdly enough, he was actually the one that killed Marilee and Kale's older brother. Um, kind of inadvertently, but um, it did happen. And then I saw that question. Uh, there is a decent, yeah, there's definitely uh, the Dark Goddess comes back here and there in this one. Uh, magic, you see a lot more of the deep magic. There's... Um, there is some more magic that I forgot about, but like there's there, there's a lot more of a wider cast, and um, this was something that like I really had to work on was like there's there's a lot of point of views on this, so I had to really kind of think about the order of chapters and whether or not I was doing too much or too little. But you know, you have a uh, like the for instance, Tim, the uh, the mages in chapter four of Traders, we actually see one of their leaders um, as part of a faction that is doing things. I don't want to get too specific on that because that's towards the end of part one of, uh, of a great for us all. And next question. And I will tell you, there's only one correct answer. Okay. Um, is, do you like maps with your fantasy or not? Absolutely. I love them. Okay, good. We can continue the conversation. Yeah, good. good. I, uh, I wish I had a better one and that's something like I'd eventually like to kickstart, um, like special editions or something, but I don't understand how that works. And I also feel like I would be like cheating people out of money by doing that. Cause like, you know, I don't know if you ever have that feeling where you're like, I feel like a little bit of a um, fraud sometimes, you know, so I don't want people to spend more money than they have to. Right. I, uh, I uh, actually got rid of most of my physical books, anything that I could get ebook of or audio. Yeah. And I, you know, my Kindle and my phone are now in my library. And mm -hmm. so I, I don't get the whole special editions and people getting them. And, oh, my God, I spent $80. I'm like, $80? I feel the same way. I'm like, I could have got, what, six audio book tokens and mm -hmm. got six books for that. I so. uh, I feel you on that. Like, I, that's something that I haven't kind of delved in. And I would maybe – like, I got – um, it's actually – like, I got it early, but I'm not allowed to open it for my birthday yet. But uh, the Vinland Saga special edition I got for my wife. And I've seen it. I'm just not allowed to read it yet. And I get it if you got something that like means a lot to you, maybe. Um, my problem now, like my special edition problem is records. Like I, I do that with records all the time. Where I'll be like, oh man, they're repressing that. I need that. And so I guess it, you know, it's books maybe not for me as much, but like I get the appeal a little bit. Yep. And I'm switching banners here, maybe. I show. And it's not. Why is it not? Oh, well, there we go. There's your link tree. Yeah. We'll put this back on because that actually goes down to the bottom. Mm -hmm. One of these days, I'll figure out these controls. I've never tried. It's, I'm impressed that you're able to have the thing go. I saw that earlier that I was scrolling with my website. and I was like, man, that's nice. So, and since I know Roe is listening from his car, I'm going to make sure this time to remember everyone, please like and subscribe. Because mm -hmm. I, I say that about one every three shows. Um but this is one of those. And I will tell people since about 90% of our viewers will watch us after the fact, you can also like and subscribe or you sh could show up live and you can torment us in the, in the comments. Mm. Yeah, Bo, I, I am not a tech person. I, my nephews are getting old to the point where they don't want to help me fix my phones anymore. 
<laughs> so I don't know what I'm going to do. Probably get those people at work who are in their early 20s to do it. That's the way to do it, man. So, so are you a plotter or a pantser or somewhere in between? Uh, somewhere in between. This one I was lucky on because I knew I so especially with Grave and they're supposed to be a standalone. I knew the mo there is a moment in Grave that um, I knew had to happen because that's what the whole story is about. And so I kind of worked backwards from there. And then what I'll do is I'll make like an outline of the chapter titles because I'm good. As you put out, my probably best thing is naming things. So I'll name things that are kind of vibe and like who's the chapter is maybe a couple lines of what happens. And then I'll uh, write for a while, get angry and switch all of those. Um, so it's kind of a mix, you know, like this, this story, I, I was fortunate that I knew most of it going into it. Hmm. So I always, I was very, always very much a plotter and I would plot out exactly what's going to happen. And then I'd start writing my character, just go, no, that's, I would never yeah, do that. That's so, mm -hmm. so I'm much less of a plotter now because my characters just rebel and I argue with them and I lose. Yeah. So, well, that's, I mean, at least you're listening to them because I feel like that's where the book really comes alive is when you let your characters just do what they would do. And I'm, I'm always like, okay, we can go on this path, but we got to get to this ending. Mm -hmm. So how do we get there? Right. Yeah, you know, I, I I almost have to beg. Um, yeah, it makes sense somehow in my mind. Um, so when did you come up with this idea for the story? I know mm. you said it wasn't a you didn't play D and D explicitly, but it was kind of there. Yeah. So um, I was talking to one of my best friends from college that we we kind of so like we had a setting in college that actually eventually is now kind of incorporated, but then I went off and made my own thing, and uh, he was he liked it so much he started using it. So actually, like, there's like three people or three groups at least that use the Traitorverse setting as uh, as their D and D setting, and I actually only know like one of them, which is kind of weird. But like, like they they started using it, and then their friends kind of broke off and started using it, and they do their own thing with it. Um, but I so the, the uh, I don't want to spoil too much, but I had this idea, and I was like, what this world needs is significant items, things that are significant that have lore around them. Like, you know, kind of like you're playing Skyrim and it's like the such and such sword of such and such or the such and such mm -hmm. cup of Saint blah, blah, blah. And I thought to myself, what would be really cool and what would be a cool story that could center around that about why this is so important? So I came up with this one event with these two characters. And honestly, like, it, it, that was all I had was that this happened, that these this person did this with this to, and this person was there. Um, and it just kind of became like a rallying cry for that group, that uh, group of people in the, the setting, because it was kind of like um, a symbol of, it was a symbol, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. I, I it, so it kind of became a lore thing. And then as I was going, I changed it up a bunch and then it, it kind of grew from there and changed from there. And um, yeah, I mean, it's all about that one moment. And I think it lands pretty good. Cause I've had a few people, like one guy, was like uh, one of my uh, beta readers was like, no, no, why, why? And it, you know, and it made me feel really good that I disturbed him so greatly. Yep. So um, you, you teach high school English. Is that right? Yeah. What, what grades? Uh, mostly right now, 11th and 12th. And I used to do a lot of 10th and then I, I've done ninth on occasion. So I do, I do all of it, uh, but mostly 11th and 12th. And you, what age are the kids when they're doing driving instructing? Uh, anywhere between 14 and a half and right before they turn 18. Yikes. Yeah. Wow. That, yeah. That's a poor story in and of itself, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, dude. It, um, some, so there's been, there's one kid, I can't say names or anything like that. And I mean, not that it would mean anything to you guys. Um, but like literally every time you drove, I'd get sick to my stomach because it was just that bad. Um, like he would get distracted and be like, Oh, birds and like drive off the road. You know what I'm saying? Oh, and, uh, for like, and I had to talk to his brother, which fortunately I knew the brother because even though he didn't go to the school that I teach at, his brother did. And I actually knew his brother pretty well. And I was like, you need to take him to the parking lot and practice all weekend. Cause he is going to fail. I cannot pass him, you know? And he got basically acceptable. <laughs> oh. So do you take them like on the interstate when you're doing this? Um, well, our, like local highways, we, we're, we're in a very rural area of North Carolina. Um, so like we, we go down to 220, which is like the, the highway here. And, um, you know, like I, I try to take them on the easy part. Um, I teach them, there's a zoo by, I live right, like right next to the North Carolina zoo. 
So like there's a highway that nobody uses except in summer where they're going to the zoo. So I'll take them down there. And uh, it just also depends. The, the hard part, and this is one of the things that's been kind of been killing me lately is because I'm the young guy uh, with driver's ed. Everybody is mostly like closer to retirement. I'm, you know, like I, I'm like 36. I can't remember how old I am. But uh, like I have to travel to other schools if they need me to. So like I'll have to like get finished teaching English, hop in a car, drive 40 minutes to, across the county, drive with them, and then drive back to my house. So it's been mm-hmm. kind of – it's brutal. But um, if I keep up with it, it will be really good for my retirement. But it's – I mean it's worth the money. I mean the money's the money's good. Yeah. Good-ish. And as long as you don't have to cash in on the life insurance policy, you know, yeah. That's true. But I have decent life insurance, thankfully. <laughs> Uh, so I want to ask, have any of your students read your books that you know of? Um, you, let me think. Um, one did, and let me think. She graduated, I think. I, I'm not sure if she graduated or like early graduated or something, because like she was there last semester and then uh, is, I think maybe like you, you can graduate in December sometimes. Uh, but she read it, and then a few of the teachers read it. I don't know if any other students have. I know a few students started – but it's also hard to get them to read anything, you know? Right. So um, I don't know. I think, I mean, I, I try not to promote it too much or like, I don't like to self promote in real life. Uh, I don't really like to self promote on Twitter, but it's kind of a necessity. Um, but I, I'll, I'll mention to some people sometimes that I wrote a book or write books, but I also don't like to be that person who's like, I wrote a book, look at my book, you know? And I, I get, I feel very strange about that. Yeah. Do you go to comic cons at all and try to sell your book? I've I've been invited a couple of times by friends to like share booths and I haven't had a chance to. Um, like right now, my main thing is like between work and then like I've got a three year old and an eight year old and I just don't have time. Fair. Or, yeah. You you can't spend the whole weekend away from home. No, that I mean we we talked about maybe next summer there's that one in Seattle where you can talk to like agents and publishers that I might go to. Yeah. Uh, but like, you know, I mean, especially like by the time you go out there, you pay for the booth, you travel there, you get your arrangements. Like my big thing, and I talked about this on Joe Byrne, uh, his uh, drink with long overdue drink with a friend uh, podcast. But like my whole thing is I can't go negative. I'm I'm only going positive, you know, so like it's all got to be self-sustainable. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, that that's going to be tough then. Oh, yeah. I've not made a profit yet. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I just don't spend. That's my main thing. But I'm I'm going to this year. I cut back. I'm probably going to eleven comic cons, not not eighteen like I did last year, which was soul crushing. I bet, dude. That's a lot. That was yeah. it fun. Um, I mean, you stand there going, "No, I'm not desperate. I'm not desperate. <laughs> Someone, please yeah. talk to me." You know, right. But then you make a sale, and you're like, "Yes, I yeah. knew it. I'm destined for." And then you sit there for another. You know, 45 minutes going, I just wish someone would come say hi. They don't have to buy my book. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, there's a reason why I didn't get a book out last year. Um, uh, it sounds like it. So, but this year I'm doing less and I'm trying to be smarter about the ones that I do. So, mm. I mean, that's that's cool. I, I would like to do more. Um, I think it'd be a cool experience. I'd, even if I don't do like a booth, just like going to one and like networking and stuff and saying like maybe meeting up with people I met online. I'm actually kind of shy in real life too, so I don't know if I would be like this. Might be the maximum of my friendliness is like talking to people online. You know, I don't know. So I I now use it when I go. I recruit to get more people to interview for the show. Uh, that makes sense. So that's my. So I mean, even if I have a crappy sales, I'm like, yeah, but I got four other people who want to be on the show. Yeah. So so yeah, and um, yeah, that's so. I don't know. You always, and I keep telling myself that I'm going to be like, Hey, do you want to do a newsletter swap? And then I like, Mm -hmm. yep, there for three days, never brought it up to anyone. Yeah. So I remember after the fact. No, I get you. I got to get mine going. Like I tried to, and the Squarespace is like, you have a certain amount free, but then you can't and whatever. And that's my problem. She's like, like I was talking to my friend Bill and it's like, I don't understand how any of this stuff works. I'm just kind of like throw things to the wall and see what sticks. And like, I've been like, you know, as far as like, like I'm so dumb about publishing. I don't know how like, like things have been going pretty decently, but like I don't know why. You know, it's just very. I have no clue. I just kind of do things. Yeah, I'm Tim. I'm with the illustrations. Of course, the guy who does my covers, he charges me a hundred bucks for a That's cover. Good. 
Mm -hmm. So I'm like, you know what? Let's get all of my characters in a scene because it's a hundred bucks and with background and everything. I mean, I could use it as a cover. Yeah, for real. That's that's my this year. I'm trying to get all my characters at least have at least one image of everybody. So yeah. Then what I'm going to do with them, I don't know. But I'm like, I can use this for promotional material somehow. As soon as someone explains how to do that to me. Yeah, for real. Like somebody was telling me about A plus uh, content on the books for Amazon. I have no idea what that is. I try to figure it out. Still don't understand. I have never heard of that. So you're further along than me. It's. Yeah, I think it's like a secret club that like people like like give you like little breadcrumbs and it's like oh what's that what's that. Uh huh. Yeah, breadcrumbs, and then you go, and then the thing snaps and breaks your neck. That's right. Yeah, that's Amazon advertising. Oh wait. That's true. I've heard really bad things about that. It, it's a great way to give Steve Bezos more money. Mm. Because, you know, yeah. he needs it. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so do you advertise at all your book or just on Twitter or what outlets yeah. do you have? Pretty much Twitter. Um, I'll do Instagram posts here and there. I've been wanting to do book talk, but I just never have time to record anything or any ideas. And I don't really understand it because I don't use – like my wife uses TikTok. But I feel like the things she's shown me have all been like romancy uh, – romancy type stuff um and i like i don't think my books are book talk friendly as much yeah. um and i think you know it's all about the right place right time and i'm kind of hoping that you know right now that my, this was supposed to be i'm a little bit ahead of where i expected to be because i didn't expect anybody to hear about traders uh at all and i expected like maybe a few people like it maybe uh i get some you know like reviews and i expected it to be like three and four stars most of the time and I was like, you know, I'll, I'll quietly work on the second one and I don't have to rush it because nobody's going to read it. And then more people read it than I expected. So I'm like, oh, man, what do I do now? Got to write this book. But like, I think that it's going to end up being like a, a very much a slow marathon for me if this is going to work out. And if this is all this, if this is all it becomes is what we've got going on. I'm really happy with it because like I don't really um, have much community other than my friends I met on um on like you know like i like i have friends in real life you know like i like people i work with but like it's cool that there are people who have the same interests as me that i've met through twitter and discord and stuff like that yeah so i i took any number of classes on you marketing your books and mm -hmm. here i am but um the one thing that the woman said that just has always stuck is it's better to do one thing well than to try to do six different things poorly mm -hmm. and that makes and sense she's, and she's like, you know what? There's a billion people on Facebook. So is there a market for your book on Facebook? Yes. But if you hate it with a passion, don't go there because it you'll suck. Yeah. And I mean, and so I've kind of I I started Twitter last May because of Spiffbo. I heard everybody's on you know Twitter, and I, it's such a party. I'm like, fine, I'll get on Twitter, and I like it because I keep it to only authors and only writing stuff. And if you dare say anything about politics, I'll block you in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. So, but that's how, yeah. I mean, that's how I got started. Was I was doing a a, pit, a pitch contest for agents back when I thought I would go traditional. And um, overall, like the first few months it was kind of like it felt like there's a bunch of people. And, it, and it, uh, this is no shade to querying authors, but it felt like a bunch of people kind of like like scrape scraping on the side of a barrel trying to get noticed. And then when I went indie and started getting more into the indie thing, I thought that was going to be like those people who just spam you all the time. But like most of the people are like really, really super cool. And I met yeah. like uh, you know, Danny Finn pretty early on, Diana Gunn uh early on. Um, you know, uh like I met you know a few people early on that just really kind of took me under their wing and talked to me, even though I was just some dude with a cover that this was before there was AI art controversy. And I don't know, I mean, I, I'll you can I'll show it to you later, but it was like Wombo art. I just typed in fantasy battle and it doesn't even look like a fantasy battle. It's just like black and white splotches. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, this is my free cover. So like people still were very nice to me, even though I had no idea and still don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so apparently I look like Eeyore, which uh, yeah. that was dirty. I don't know. Eeyore is probably the best, uh, probably the best character. Most realistic. Definitely. <laughs> So, yeah, and Bo, yeah, 99.9% .9 of the time until you get the one person who decides to act really stupid in, in a very public way, which is yeah. kind of fun to watch and be like, man, I may not know much, but I know better than that. That is so true. 
Yeah, there's there's some weird takes and weird things that people do, and I, I think that there's that idea that uh, you know all advertisement or all publicity is good publicity. That's a hundred percent not true. You know, not at all. Yeah, what was the one the author who complained about her four star review and because yeah. it broke her perfect? Yeah, and which really she needed that because like I, I that was the thing that actually kind of freaked me out was like you know you, early on nobody wants to give you low star reviews or or you know non five star reviews so like but it looks so fake when you see a book that has perfect five stars yep i actually had a writer friend who you know i said i'd read her book and give her a review and i read like five or six chapters and i was like look i yeah. i can give you three and a half and that's kind of being generous and she's like all of my reviews have been five stars. I'm like, mm. well, I mean, I'm sorry. This, you know, I, I, I said, here's the review. You, I'll post it or not. You tell me if you want me to. Yeah. But, you know, and this is these are the issues that I have with your book. You know. Right. Right. And she finally she's like, no, I have a perfect score. Don't post that. I'm like, okay. That's so crazy to me, man. Like, I, I've seen that. And that's one of the reasons that, like, I try to be kind of careful with other indie authors. Um, and I, like when I first started, I was very nervous and I would try to be very, uh, generous with it. Um, you know, so like if I, if I can't give an honest review to a book, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll talk to the author and be like, Hey, this is, this is kind of what I thought. Um, it, and a lot of times it's not even, it's not even the book so much as it's me. Like there's one I can think of where almost everybody I know who's read it likes it a lot. And a lot of other people or a, sim a smaller amount of people are like me where it just does not work for them at all. And that's not necessarily the book's fault, but like sometimes you got to be aware that not every book is going to land with every person, you know? Right. Uh, I mean, with her book, she just would repeat things over uh, and over. Mm -hmm. And I was like, look, your 85,000 word book should probably be 70,000. You oh, need no. to have a yeah. good editor come in here and just scrub it. And mm -hmm. she did not want to hear that. Oh, but, no. well, you know, a lot of times it's like that, uh, you know, it's your, your baby. You don't want people to think negatively about something you work so hard on and you know like like that one there's like been a few of them where it's like you know they work on their book for 10 plus years and um you know you got to feel for them a little bit that like yeah i mean like you know it's kind of like everybody and that's why i tell my kids with essay writing everybody starts at a different level everybody starts at a different level with riding a bike or whatever not everybody can get on a bike and just start going and um you know it's good that they tried you know and it you know it's 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 about there's value in that but like like when somebody tells me that my book has issues. I know my book has issues. You know what I mean? Like it, it's not a perfect book at all. Um, but you know, the, the thing that I've been surprised about is how many people are willing to overlook those issues and be like, man, this book really meant something to me. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure you yeah. have that too, where it's like, oh, I yeah. really enjoyed this. And um, you know, like, I don't know. Like, I think that there's this like ego that all creators have where it's like, mine is the best that it's going to change the world. And I, I've never really felt that way about it. You know what I mean? Well, it's kind of you're kind of neurotic about it. you're like yes this is the best thing ever oh my god everyone will hate it and yeah. you and you just you're bipolar almost and you just oh yeah go from one to the other and then imposter syndrome and the whole nine yards for sure for sure um, and that's the thing is i'm oh, sorry go ahead oh i was going to say i uh i i'm to the point now when i edit when i get because ro actually is my editor mm. and he tears my stuff apart and i mean mm. And it's the best thing could happen. And I, I love it. I'm like, you know what? Because this is all fixable. I'm making my book yeah, demonstrably yeah. better. I'm like, this. what is not to be excited about? So uh, the hardest thing for me is the first draft. Yeah, because yeah. staring at a blank page and coming up with something is hard. But after that, I'm like, I don't care. Get something on there because I'll go through it 16 times. And it'll get better every time. And finally, yeah. it'll, it'll get publishable you know, quality. Right. But yeah, I've given up the whole, I'll write a perfect book. No, never. Yeah. So. And I mean, that's the thing is like, that's the thing I think is cool about indie is like, unless it's like egregiously, like there's like some horrible issue with it, people are willing to give you a chance, you know? Yeah. Um, and I mean, like, and I think too, like sometimes people get in their own heads about things. Like you see a lot of people overwrite uh, things where it's like, you know, if you had maybe left this alone a little bit more, it might have been better. But that's how I feel too is like, uh, both the chapters for Grave, the first chapter for Grave, the first chapter for Traitors were like six or 7,000 words long, like way too long. And I had to cut it down by like 3,000 words each, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, like that's a, that's a flaw that I've been working on. And then like, um, you know, same thing, like I had a, a friend edit my book, 
I keep hearing about people arguing with their editors and it's like, why would you, especially if you're hiring them, like why would you hire somebody to edit your book and then argue and say, this is how I write. I get it. If it's an authorial voice thing, but like sometimes it's, sometimes it's not, you know? Right. So I am uh, actually J.R. White is going to be on here next month. You probably don't know. I met him at an author convention. Mm-hmm. He was a professional MMA fighter. Wow. Um, and one of the talks he did was, you know, about fighting fight scenes and fiction. Mm-hmm. And he's like, listen, fights are over in about 30 seconds. Yeah. Because they happen in a bar. Two people are drunk and the first person to connect wins. Yep. He's like, you know, MMA does everything it can do to you know, make it last longer. You know, mm-hmm. he's like, so these people who have like 18 page fight scenes, he's like, yeah. no, just stop. And then, mm-hmm. I mean, but just listening to him was. I mean, I, I like to tell people, I have a friend who was an MMA professional fighter. Yeah. 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 It was him. I've talked to him twice. Uh, but anyway, he uh, he's like, when, when you're fighting, he's like, you don't have time to, oh, that the punch to my chin just reverberated through my skull. I'm like, no. You, no, you know, no, like, no. Yeah. It's like damage. You know, yes. it's all you get, and then you go on until you're put down. Yeah, that's that's how I like to write like very visceral fight scenes. I, I remember like Joe Abercrombie did that with one of his fight scenes where like the guy got hit with an axe and he was dead. You know what I mean? Because if you get hit with an axe, you're probably gonna yeah. die. So yeah. like I try to do the same thing where like uh, it's you know usually a couple mo- like you know I have a couple people who are better fighters than other people, but like for instance, Kale in uh, Revenge of Thousands, like he's the kind of describing fighting these kind of ill prepared people, and it's like I took off his hand, I slid him from you know belly to you know whatever. Because the thing is, like most, if you get hit by a sword, you're not going to be like, "Haha, I'm going to fight for you know several more <laughs> minutes." I'm like, if you hit me with a sword or any medieval weapon, I'm going to lay down and cry. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm done. I am done. So, and just to answer Bo's comment here, yeah. I am the person that if I read your book and I see a lo- logical flaw, mm-hmm. oh my god, you are dead to me. Um, I mean, I'll overlook spelling now, right? Um, but you know, just if you're like, wait, you said that was impossible and now you need it to make the ending come to fruition. You don't explain how it's all of a sudden, you know, I was like, so yeah, I, I definitely, if you have flaws, I will find them in, uh, that's one for me too, is the lot like, like leaps in logic. And I think part of yeah. it's being an English teacher. The other one I really don't like is, um, and I, this is one that I kind of struggled with in trainers for like two specific characters, but I don't like it when the characterization happens really quickly. And I, I had to be careful with that. I, I, and I, I think I mostly succeeded in that. And actually, my friend Quinn is the one person who pointed out that the two characters were a little bit too fast characterization was. And that was one of my favorite reviews because I was like, exactly. That was probably too fast. I probably needed to go back and change that. But, you know, like, you know, you're never going to get it 100% right. And even like our favorite authors, they always say, you know, read the one star reviews of a book you really loved and read the five star reviews of a book you really hated. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so are you still holding out hope to be traditionally published one day? You know, I don't really know. Um, I, uh, I, if the right offer came along and, you know, oh, somebody, yeah. you know, somebody was like, Hey, you know, we think we believe in your books and we want to, we want to do that. Um, you know, like I've, I've had some talks with some people, um, nothing like big, big yet, or like f- even concrete, but mostly like, it seems like what the, what you're going to end up doing with indie to either you're going to get, you know, a smaller press will pick you up if if you want that. And to me, I, similar to my whole I don't spend money on anything is if it's something that it has to be something I can't do for myself. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, wh- why give up rights if I can do it myself? Um, the other one I've seen is like I, I talked to somebody about translation for uh, traders or they talked to, you know, they talked to me. I, I think I'm kind of low on their totem pole because I saw the other books of people they're talking to. <laughs> And I, I'm like, yeah, get, go get them first. I understand. Like, I, I'll, I'll be around. <laughs> Nobody's going to swoop in and get me for the, the translation into this language. You know what I mean? Yeah. What language are you? Or are they looking at? Uh, Italian. Italian. Yeah. So, and I don't. I mean, like, it, it, I don't know that it's definite or anything like that. And that's the thing is, like, you know, the, the thing that I've noticed too. And speaking of like indie and all that, is I, I never hold anything against anybody if they say they're going to do something like read my book, review my book. They want to do this. They want to talk to me about this. 
you know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. We can still be friends. You know, if you hate traders, that's fine. You know, I don't care. You know, it's not for everybody. If you uh, said that you wanted to talk to me about publishing and we don't publish, I get it. You know, that's that's how the world goes. Yeah. I, uh, I'm to the point now where I actually, the three star reviews are gold mm -hmm. because it'll be like, you know, it was okay, but I, these were the faults. I, and I'm like, thank you. Yeah. Um, and five star reviews. I mean, they're good for the ego, but you're like, yeah, but I know my book has flaws and they've just, you know, yeah. you know, glossed over them. So they're kind of not as helpful. Right. Like the three and the four and four, if they're like this, this in particular was, you know, did not work. I'm like, thank you. Yeah, I, I feel that because that's how you grow is like, you know, I think that there's this idea that you shouldn't ever look at um, this is, you know, you shouldn't ever look at um, your reviews. But like I've had some really like reviews that I'm like, you know, I do need to work on that. That's something I need to work on. Or I didn't think I was good at writing action. I thought I was terrible at writing action. Everybody's like the action in this is so good because I was going to go like less action heavy with Grave. And then I'm like, oh, apparently I'm good at it. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. So, um, let's see. What advice would you give to an aspiring grimdark author? I um, I think that the main thing I would say for like really any author at all is like just try to be authentic and try to write the story that you want to write, and don't worry if it's if it's like there's a moment when I was writing traders, and actually I think Jared Lee's uh, was one of my earlier readers who mentioned this. I was like, this is not a normal fantasy book in some ways. And, um, you know, just just take risks. Just do it. I kind of wish I had taken a more risk with traders, but, you know, I was thinking I'd go trad pub with it. So I, I limited it to 117,000 words. And um, I try to make it a little bit, you know, not try to make it not too out there as far as some of the stuff goes. But, you know, like just kind of go for it. Just do some weird stuff. Put it out there. Like yeah. who knows what's going to happen. So my the one piece of advice I always I wish I had been told is that they're like don't be in a rush to publish your first book because then it's like okay they want the second I have to and then it it becomes more of a job and yeah whereas if you're just like this is wonderful I mean uh, you you mentioned Andrew Meredith uh, I think he's wrote like what the first three books in his collation saga before he published one and I'm mm -hmm. like oh my god so there's That's zero so smart That's so like, smart. <laughs> I'm like, there's, there's zero pressure on you to, you know, crank out something because I didn't get my book out until January this year. I published December of 2022 and then January of 2024. So over for, for yeah. 2023. And I just, I was like, oh my God, I've not got anything out. People are going to forget I exist. And it yeah. just takes a toll. So I'm like, you know what? Right. Write a lot. Mm -hmm. Because once you publish, then it becomes more of a, because you want to succeed. And if you want to succeed, that means you have to, you know, Keep going. Yeah, list and then you hit start marketing your book which i don't even tell people that that's the hardest part it is because they think writing the book is hard and i'm like <laughs> oh no yeah. uh, so oh uh, yeah tim is smart so uh now that i remember uh the Clayton saga actually the first book was three separate books that he published a while ago and then compiled them into a single book um, which speaking of like, if you haven't read Deathless Beast, um, uh, Bone Shroud and uh, Gloves of Eons, they're all fantastic. Um, really, really good writing, great world building. I actually personally am a, a fan more of like Thrice and um, uh, what was Four it? Score. Four Scored. Four Scored. Those yeah. to me were like, are like pinnacle, like some pinnacle indie books right there. I also like the Clayton Saga a lot, but the like Thrice and uh, Four Scored to me, it reminds me of kind of like those those folklore mythy type things that I, that I really like. And he is yeah. such, as Tim said, he's a solid dude. He's, he helped me so much, uh, especially when I didn't think my second book would ever come out because I wrote most of this in 2022 and it's been like a slow going ever since then. Yep. So I, uh, I'm taken because I, I read or I listened to bone shroud. Mm. That's the first one, right? No. Deathless beast is Death the first beast, one. Right. I tried the second. Yeah. Deathless Beast. I listened to that and I'm like, I know Andrew's voice. I mm. do not hear Andrew's voice, but I know he read it. But I mean, he's, I'm like, he is he's just so good. Mm -hmm. Because everyone has their own distinct voice and none of them sound like his speaking voice. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, uh, I'm saving up to, for him to do the Trader's audiobook, but like he, he is such a, and like he told me how he does some of that stuff, like with the female voices and stuff. 
he puts a lot of love into those audiobooks. Yep. Yep. So I, I have not approached him yet. I'm like, I don't know if I can even afford you, but, but yeah, it, I, I that's the other thing is, do you have audiobooks? Oh, no. So I'm, I'm saving up for Andrew to do mine. I, like, yeah. again, I, I have, uh, I have some put away for it. Um, I have my price of how much it's going to take roughly. And I thought about kickstarting it. But like I said, once again, I don't really understand how that works at all. Um, and like, I know that some people are interested and like, that's the thing is like, I'm kind of like, I really can't do more than I'm already doing book wise with everything else going on. I, and I really want to get to, uh, some of my other projects in crown and type three. Um, and I just, it's just so much to do, you know, and I'm hoping yeah. that like, by the time my kids are older, it won't be as big of a deal. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I tell people, I was like, I come home from work and then I spend probably three to four hours every night doing something mm. and, I mean, it just, it, it doesn't end. Like I said, marketing is much harder than writing. For sure. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I was lucky. I have the first three books are on audiobook, mm. And now I'm like, uh, I got to save up hard for the fourth one because I can't, you know, stop. Right. The, but, there's that expectation. Yeah. So um, let's see. Is there anything that I should have asked you that I did not? Mm, not that i can think of to be honest i honestly i feel like we we covered a lot of bases anybody in comments have any questions at all because i probably do need to get going i think my kids are outside with my wife they got ice cream while i was doing this because otherwise we would have been disrupted uh last quick question then so you can get to your family how did you become a twitter sensation i, I don't know that sensation is the right word like Over so four thousand followers yeah, well, I, so I think like I think what early on, back before Elon bought it, there was an easier way to get the algorithm to favor you. So like I figured out that if you responded to everybody who commented on your tweets, that it would show it to more people. So I just kept doing that, and I could pretty reliably back then get uh, like I had one tweet that had like I forget exactly how much, but it was like it was like over ten thousand likes or something like that. And wow. it, it, you know, but you can't really do that anymore. Um, and, but the other thing too, and this is what I think I saw somebody say, it was, it was slow going up to a certain point. And then it's, it's kind of like, once you get to a certain amount of followers, it, it just keeps happening. Like I'll, I'll follow back writers that look like they're real people most of the time. Right. Um, but you know, a lot of it is just like, I just get on there, I'll say something kind of dumb and some people will like it and maybe they'll follow me. I don't know. It just, I think like, you know, that's the thing I was kind of surprised about is, uh, I didn't, I didn't really expect that. Uh, to happen like that and uh, that's one of the reasons why every time people are like twitter's gonna shut down i'm like i will be screwed because i'm never gonna sell a book again so do you sell anywhere else other than twitter um you know i really other than like just like kind of briefly posting on instagram not really um i need to figure out better marketing but that's all i got right now until so, i get more time so i'll tell you that i lucked into um andrew wizard yeah he actually, he had, I was on, he's like, Hey guys, my wife and I put a bid on our dream house knowing full well, we'd never got, get it. Well, we got it. So now I have to paint every room in the next week in this house so we can sell it. So I'm only going to be doing audiobooks. And I was like, Andrew, I have an audiobook. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I do stuff like, you know, I'll, I, I have a few um, people right now have grave um, like Dr. Morrow already. I was really surprised. I was really excited that he got to so quickly. Cause I wasn't expecting that he, Seems like he really liked it. Um, he writes the best reviews. I know, dude. He's such a good dude. Like speaking of like people who are good in the community, Doctor Morrow is one of my favorite people. He sent mm -hmm. my son science experiments because he knew that he was interested in um, STEM stuff, and I was just like, you know, how great is that? That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I I reach out to booktubers. I have this channel. I do Twitter. I have a right. Facebook account that I pretty much ignore. Right. And I was like, this is going to be the year. I'm either going to use it or I'm going to shut it down. Well, I, I know which way it's going. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. I feel you. So, but anyway, I don't want to keep you so you can get to your family. Um, well, yeah, sure this is great time. Ice cream, but oh, well. Oh, yeah. They, I think the ice cream's done melted probably by now. But, hey, thanks you for having me on. Hey, you have to suffer for your craft. Well, Michael, thank you for that. I will hit the end screen and we can wave awkwardly until it decides to actually end. <laughs>